Welcome to Broadband Breakfast Live Online. My name is Drew Clark. I'm editor and publisher of Broadband Breakfast and joining you today on Wednesday, March 30th, 2022. Uh, today, we have a special discussion about technology and the environment and very much looking forward to uh, our discussion on this topic. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll have a uh, a great um, conversation uh, with uh, reporter Benjamin Kahn, who's here with me. And we may have some additional guests, but whether we do or don't, we'll, we'll have a uh, exciting discussion about the subject of uh, technology and the environment. But before we get to that, let me just uh, speak a little bit about um, uh, what's happening uh, on Broadband Breakfast for the next several weeks. Um, we are doing the either the second or the third, I guess, depending on how you count. Actually, quite frankly, we've, we've probably done um, uh, nearly a dozen episodes on broadband mapping uh, in the uh, two years that we've been doing Broadband Breakfast Live Online, and probably more than 20 or so, uh, if you consider uh, the legacy uh, Broadband Breakfast events that we've been doing uh, since 2008. Um, we at Broadband Breakfast, we are a media community uh, we focus on uh, better broadband, better lives, uh, which includes the infrastructure. It includes the tools that um, individuals use to access higher capacity broadband, and also the policy issues around big technology and its role in our life today. So all of these are a part of our uh, coverage at Broadband Breakfast. We do reporting every business day. And of course we do these events every, every week. And now we're also doing events in person every month. So I was starting to mention that uh, next week, April 6th, we'll be talking about broadband mapping and data, part two of a three-part series. We're gonna focus a little bit more on some of the in-home aspects of broadband uh, availability, networking, uh, the issues uh, that, that, that maybe Im impact uh, uh, poor, uh, good or not good performance of broadband in a home. And that will be followed two weeks from today, April 13th, with our broadband breakfast for lunch event. And we're gonna have Alan Davidson, the administrator of the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, uh, at Clyde's of Gallery Place. So if you're in Washington, we hope you will go to the page for this event and register and join us in person at Clyde's of Gallery Place. Arrive at 1130 in the morning and uh, enjoy lunch as part of that uh, registration. And, uh, and then um, Alan and uh, the program will begin at 12. If you're not in Washington or can't make it, you're still very welcome to join us here on this link as, as you are um, right now. Um, following Alan uh, on the 13th, we're going to be talking about uh, another big tech topic, censorship by companies or censorship by a country, right? And so this, this topic was inspired in some respects by some of the uh, new great firewalls that we're seeing. Obviously, China has long had a great firewall. Um, Saudi Arabia, Iran have both uh, implemented, Iran most recently. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about the impact of some of those uh, censorship regimes. Uh, Russia, of course, I mean, ramped this up extraordinarily. Uh, uh, it was already closer and closer, but, but over the last uh, five weeks with the invasion of Ukraine, uh, we've just seen um, you know, literally a, a closing down of, of Russian independent media, um, you know, the, one of the last uh, independent uh, media companies closed its door during the duration of the um, the invasion of Ukraine uh, because it simply can't can't write. Uh, um, so, so we're going to talk about that, but we're also going to be talking about big tech, right, and the power that big tech has. Uh, you know, particularly if they start to act in lockstep, like if if you get deep platform from Twitter and you get deep platform from Facebook and you get deep platform from YouTube. Well, is that a form of censorship? You know, we're going to talk about that. We're going to have a, a great discussion around that. And then four weeks from today, uh, we'll be talking about new wires on old poles. Okay, that's our uh, 
it's our uh, metaphor for um, pole attachments, which is of course a fascinating, fascinating topic. And uh, I'm serious. I'm serious. I'm not, I'm not joking. Pole attachments are really a very exciting topic. And we will be talking about that in four weeks time. Before we turn to today's topic, I do also want to give a huge shout out to our sponsors. Uh, we're actually joined by a new sponsor today for the first time, uh, but let me go ahead and include them in the mix. We have uh, our, our sponsors include Utopia Fiber, Lit Communities, Broadband.Money, Broadband Now, Powerhouse Management, Lightbox, Ookla, Samsung Electronics America, Render Networks, Positron Access, and the California Emerging Technology Fund. So big welcome to Ookla joining us now as a sponsor of Broadband Breakfast. Um, let's uh, begin to um, veer towards our topic. And so to do that, I'm gonna go ahead and um, uh, share my screen here with, or not share my screen, but just share the view with uh, Ben Kahn. Uh, Benjamin, uh, thank you for being willing to be on this topic, Ben. We're, we're of course talking today about the issue of uh, technology and the environment. And specifically, uh, the way we framed this, of course, was how technology helps the environment. But I guess before we can even get to how technology helps the environment, we also have to discuss how technology hurts the environment or how human activity hurts the environment. And so uh, I know you've given a little bit of thought to this topic, Ben. Ben is, is uh, one of our veteran reporters at Broadband Breakfast. He's been with us for more than a year. And he's covered a range of topics from uh, to infrastructure to big tech. Um, ben, uh, as, you've, as you've thought more about this topic and um, some of the uh, issues and some of the reporting you've done and some of your colleagues have done, tell us a little bit about um, how you think about this issue of uh, technology and the environment. Sure, and thanks for having me on, Drew. Uh, I kind of think about this through a three-pronged approach. So there's, you have to go far back in, you know, in all this, and you have to start with the supply chain. But ultimately, it goes supply chain, engineering, and infrastructure. Those are kind of the three prong, prong excuse me, that really, that, that impact the environment. And there's no question that this, that humans are having an impact on the environment. Insofar that supply chains are concerned, uh, companies have to, a lot of companies are working, whether it's with manufacturing with third parties or transporting with third parties or engineering in third parties, they have to consider uh, the environmental consciousness of, consciousness of the uh, entities that they choose to work with. Um, and so, as I said, whether that's, uh, whether that's in manufacturing, whether that's in transportation, they have to set certain standards for accountability and for themselves and for the third party. Because ultimately, the, if, it, if a company decides that they want to pursue a green initiative or the company wants to decide that they want to uh, pursue an environmentally sustainable practice, it's somewhat moot unless the companies that they're, that they're partnering with are also on the same page. Uh, we don't want to just be exporting our pollution and, uh, and uh, you know, our non-environmental practices to another country uh, that if, if, if an entity is uh, partnering with them. And so it really starts at that supply chain level, but it also goes into the engineering level, which is a company who's designing products, whether that's a chipset, whether that's uh, various components in a vehicle, whether that's a com component that goes into radio access networks, whatever it may be, um, or whether that's just a computer, what have you, it, you don't just want to design the product to be electronically or electrically efficient. Uh, that's great and that should be incentivized, but we also need to think about um, cutting down on e-waste. And so that means making products uh, making products more um, sustainable, making, making them last longer, and then also pushing for initiatives uh, such as digital refurbishment. And this is something that the FCC has come out in support of uh, recently, as, as late as last month, um, FCC commissioners were discussing uh, digital refurbishment and how that should be incentivized because 
ultimately, if we just keep churning out products and devices, uh, you know, that, that's still not sustainable. We need to be able to be able to reuse these. And that also will help address issues in the digital divide, which is kind of where I want to tie in this third point here, which has to do with infrastructure. Uh, as we all know, you know, it's becoming almost a little bit trite to say, but we are in the midst of a once in a lifetime opportunity to deploy uh, infrastructure around the country, whether that's broadband infrastructure, whether that's uh, roads and highways, what ha or uh, rails, you know, what have you. The Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act is huge for this. And one of the technologies that obviously we at Broadband Breakfast are super supportive of is fiber. Um, you know, we love to say that we have, we're a big supporter of having fiber in our diet. And one of the reasons is, is that fiber is just so incredibly scalable. Um, a lot of cities that, that push for dig once initiatives, for example, that minimizes the impact that the technology has on the environment. You dig once when you're going down for other infrastructure, and that's when you're able to actually lay and deploy the fiber. Fiber is able to meet consumer needs decades out. It's scalable. It has the most potential. It has the greatest, uh, you know, throughput, and that's what really has enabled over the course of the pandemic when people were forced to uh, telecommute or you know use distance learning or leverage telemedicine. Fiber did that the the best in a lot of cases because you have so much. You can benefit from so much throughput, uh, and how does that tie into the environment? Well, you know, it was great that some people were able to benefit from all those things during the pandemic. But during the pandemic, we also saw it cut down on commuting. So there were fewer cars on the road. There were fewer people stuck in traffic. And that was a, as bizarre as it is to say, because of all the you know terrible things that come along with the pandemic, that was actually kind of a positive is that we saw that there was less air pollution due to vehicles. And so this is one of the other reasons why we need to address the digital divide and, you know, deploy fiber to some of these areas uh, that are currently on the wrong side of the digital divide is that ultimately it's also a net positive for the environment. America has, you know, you know tens of millions of vehicles on the road. Uh, and if we want to cut down on that, we have to provide opportunities for people to benefit from, from telecommuting. We have to provide them with uh, opportunities to benefit from telemedicine. And, uh, and distance learning. And even though the FCC wants to talk a lot about uh, and 5G technology and 5, 5G wireless technology, that doesn't subtract fiber from the equation. Fiber is going to be a part of these builds. Uh, it's just a matter of where it is in the network, whether that's fiber to the node or fiber to the home, fiber to the premises, but fiber enables all kinds of uh, innovations that we've mentioned, we've mentioned above. Um, but it also enables things like precision agriculture and smart cities and the uh, smart grid uh, that will enable other innovations such as smart lighting, smart vehicles, and really just uh, impact the environment positively on a much larger scale, the more fiber that we're able to deploy. Andrew, you're muted, sorry. Yes, that happens all the time. Um, uh, and and uh, Ben, it's 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 great to get this this perspective and and the the the, the multifaceted ways in which uh, technology impacts the environment. I, I wanted to um, uh, guide our, our our listeners and watchers through uh, several uh, recent examples of uh, reporting on Broadband Breakfast. Um, I'm just going to make sure you're a co-host here, Ben, so you can invite people if uh, they join while I share my screen. So I'm going to share my screen in focusing on uh, some of the reporting that we've done on this topic. So just give me one quick moment here while I do that. All right. So this is the, uh, the page for uh, today's event. Uh, as, as you know, if I were to click this, I'd get an infinity screen here. But um, we, we 
have a discussion. Uh, obviously, we, we uh, hope, hope we'll get uh, a couple more people. And if you have something uh, that you'd like to say on this, please feel free to uh, put it through the chat window. Or if you're not watching on Zoom, go, go to the, the page for this event and uh, register and join the Zoom so you can uh, be heard on this discussion point. Um, but but these uh, eight articles we've put in here as panelist resources, and they, they uh, discuss things from uh, action on e-waste uh, to um, uh, energy saving agreements, to some of the smart cities aspects, as well as the greener aspects of getting online. And so uh, I wanted to just take a few minutes here to uh, go through a little bit about uh, these articles. Uh, and, and I think one of them touches upon something you, you just spoke about, uh, Ben, which is the uh, uh, e-waste action, right? So uh, this is, this is uh, a, a proposal uh, to on the refurbishment of technology devices, okay? And so, you know, the technology industry has been aware and conscious of the need to make sure that uh, their products are not creating uh, a, a huge impact. And this kind of goes to the, I don't know, the inputs or outputs, the environmental impact that, that you spoke about, one of the first uh, uh, points that you made there, uh, ben, and um, you know, in, in order to address uh, the, the impact that um, uh, technology um, devices play. Okay, so that's that's one aspect we could think of, of in terms of just you know the actual computers and phones as they get old and they go into waste. Uh, how how negative is that impact on the environment? Um, another uh, piece here, talking uh, you know more about this a little bit earlier, and it's not just the environment. But it's about, or I should say, it's not just e-waste, but it's also about the impact of um, 5G mobile networks, right? And so that that's a, a, as well a question uh, because you know we we can see potential negatives as well as potential positives uh, in the sense of uh, greater impacts uh, in terms of the environment, but also greater benefits on the environment. And uh, you know this this uh, strengthening mobility and revolutionizing uh, trans transportation initiative uh, is, is another one uh, discussion point there. Um, I wanted to uh, go as well to a, a recent expert opinion we had on making the planet greener by getting online. This was by um, Sunny McPeak and Martha Iskutia about climate change, okay? And the role, uh, this was at the time of the, um, the COP26 climate, ch climate change conference of the parties in, uh, in Scotland. Uh, and uh, the authors of this expert opinion f highlighted the, you know, the, the, the economy, the environment, and the community equity part, okay? And I think, Ben, what you've talked about here when, in regard to the green impacts of of, of technology and particularly fiber, but but I wouldn't I wouldn't limit it to that. I think that that all aspects of, of broadband technology can um, can be shown to be kind of a, a net improver because of, of the ability to reduce the outputs, to reduce the uh, the drives to work, or to reduce the uh, you know trips to school or or whatever uh, component in terms of those those outputs. Um, I want to. Um, Again, this, this article here uh, on the set top box uh, and, and an agreement regarding, uh, you know, this is kind of getting to the, the outputs issue. And um, like I said, I was, I was hopeful we'd be able to discuss some smart city networks, including one at, that Utah Valley University has been uh, focused on. And if we, if we get a, a person from that organization, we'll look forward to talking a little bit about some of the smart city deployments that are happening there as well as in other places. And one last item that I wanna kind of call to everyone's attention is um, uh, an application that uh, we see on a number of, of networks, including the Utopia Fiber Network in Utah, where there are smart, uh, smart applications. This, this, this piece doesn't refer to it as much as uh, the next one here does, which is a... Um, it's a uh, air quality monitor. So uh, this, this article here, uh, this is from 2019, uh, discusses how communities 
that are part of the network have access to a free and open internet without throttling, paid prioritization, or other provider interference. But there are also smart city applications enabled by the Utopia Fiber Network, including air quality monitoring, smart water, and energy management. This air quality application is, is really cool. It's almost worth sort of a special discussion on its own. I think it's called Purple Air, right? And, and it and enables uh, you to see on a location by location basis, the quality of air through like, like literally neighborhood by neighborhood or, or street by street. And, uh, you know, again, I, I think we're, we're entering a world where we're seeing a lot more um, active smart meter monitoring. And uh, while sometimes it is true, these applications do not require huge bandwidth. I guess you want to be clear on that, that a lot of IoT, Internet of Things applications aren't bandwidth hogs. But when you start to add everything in, I mean, I think that smart city applications are more often than not linked to a comprehensive uh, uh, enhancement of broadband network capability. And again, more often than not, that, that comes from having a fiber backbone uh, that's that's in place. So um, those are just kind of a, a, a quick tour of some of the reading that we put on this page. Ben, let's let, let you react to, to that, and uh, and then we'll have a more full discussion with our our uh, participants here. Sure thing. Uh, I just want to touch on something I saw Daniel uh, Smith drop in the chat, which is refurbishing computers will help us close the digital divide. And at uh, Broadband Breakfast, you know, we like to say. Uh, better broadband, better lives. And in this case, you know, I'm a firm believer that, that that we can add a little addendum to that, which is, you know, better environment as well. Because when, because as, as we kind of touched on earlier, the digital divide, it, not only does it, it impacts every part of, you know, society, but we can't forget about the environmental impact. Uh, because when you have, you know, we touched on it about the roads, uh, you know, keeping people off the roads and you know, minimizing traffic and commuting and, and things of that nature. But it really does permeate through every aspect of, of, of this discussion, where if you have people better connected, you have them, you have, they have access to better resources. Um, it's making them more informed about the decisions that they make. That's that also plays a role in having, uh, you know, people who are informed about uh, how they can impact the environment. Um, to to the point that um, with, with this digital refurbishment would mean that, for example, whether that's computers going to, let me, let me draw your attention real quick to, I can drop a link to this in the chat, but this was a relationship that was facilitated. Uh, this is just a press release that can tell you more and direct you to other resources, but this is by uh, Starry. Uh, who we, we've spoken to people from Star on multiple occasions, um, but they partnered with Human IT, and their their effort was to get devices to people in public and affordable housing. And it's initiatives like this that will not only help to close the digital divide, but will also work towards you know improving the environment ultimately for reasons that we've already outlined. Getting devices into libraries, into schools, ensuring that people have access to these uh, devices that and a broadband connection will really be an important step in, um, you know, making sure that people are informed on the subject and able to make informed decisions about uh, how they impact the environment and what their carbon footprint is, for example. Um, ben, what are, what are some of the um, ways you've seen the, um, the, the, the issue of the environment? Um, let's, let's, let's talk, let's talk, t take the supply chain, and the partnerships, uh, uh, you know, question, right? How how have you seen this this play out in the reporting that you've you've done on on tech companies, uh, you know, either either very recently or or over the past year year and and, and more, Ben? Sure. So, a lot of companies, and I'm tr I, I'm blanking on a few of the specifics, but they they make pledges to partner with uh, organizations or you know other. Uh, companies that they work with in the supply chain, they make pledges of accountability and they make pledges to only work with uh, companies that have uh, standards that are up to their, 
you know, that are aligned with their values. So ethically sourcing their materials, whether that's, uh, in like, we, we hear a lot about how they ethically source things to make sure that they're not be, uh, benefiting from forced labor, things of that nature. But that, that same concept applies to, um, if they're, you know, adhering to recycling standards or adhering to uh, proper waste disposal standards, uh, ensuring that that the, the companies that they choose to work for are compliant or work with are compliant in not only their standards, but regional and local standards as well. So once again, we're not just exporting our waste to another country or we're just exporting our pollution uh, to a third world country where, oh, well, it's now it's their problem because they're the ones that are manufacturing and have to deal with the fallout of those decisions. Because ultimately, you know, that's still going to impact us down the line. So these standards and um, the, the uh, standards of an, and accountability practices play a large role. And there are several companies that have been engaged in this. Unfortunately, I'm just blanking on a few of them at the present time. Well, um, uh, we, we, one of our, one of our uh, uh, attendees uh, would uh, like to speak to this issue. Um, uh, he, he's raised these points in the chat window. Um, and thank you for being a, a regular uh, on our program, Ron. Um, sure. I'm, I'm ex excited to, to meet you. Uh, to, to tell us, uh, tell everyone a little bit about yourself, Ron, and some of the points you're, you're raising here about um, making sure that we repurpose old uh, technology and telecommunications equipment? Uh, well, uh, I'm very interested in the uh, digital uh, divide. In, in February, uh, we just uh, uh, filed articles of incorporation for a Michigan nonprofit, charitable, educational. Uh, and uh, the main thing that we're doing is, you know, teaching people uh, how to uh, do a DIY uh, I, ISP. Uh, but here in my house, also, I'm uh, quadriplegic. So I use uh, adaptive devices to make my computer work. And my fingers are partially paralyzed. But I can use my Android phone to turn lights on and off and do lots of things in, in the house. And I've saved my old Android phones. So I don't have, when I go up and down the stairs with an electric lift, I don't always have to figure out how to carry my phone with me. And I think that, you know, people who uh, don't have uh, money to buy themselves new iPhones, you know, all the time or kids in schools or extra family members, uh, there's no reason to throw out your old Android phones or just, you know, leave them packed up in, in a drawer. We need to find ways to uh, distribute those uh, better uh, to people. And we're, one of the technologies we're teaching people about is Althea, uh, which mm -hmm. puts uh, software on your router so you can buy and sell bandwidth. And they're now, uh, the CEO, Deborah Simpierre was just in Puerto Rico creating a 5G network. Uh, they've done LTE in places like the Philippines uh, in remote areas where there weren't telecommunications. So instead of everything you know, being locked up, if you have a mesh network uh, and you're a member of that mesh network, you can use an old Android phone. Um, you can't make 911 calls. Uh, you, you need a, a, a real telecommunications uh, connection uh, to do that, but you can do all sorts of other calls. So in families with, with kids, uh, it's a way of having multiple devices for people to browse the internet or to the extent it's possible to do homework on, uh, on your phone, you, you can use that. Ron, uh, you, you, again, uh, it's, it's great to meet you face to face here uh, on, on this discussion. And thank you for raising your hand and being willing to join. You've, you've raised so many good points in previous discussions as well. Do you mind my asking a little bit about kind of the inclusion aspect of technology, right? I mean, as, as someone without the, the, the use of, of many or most of your, of your you know, limbs, how, how does technology uh, help you day to day? I mean, like, could you just talk a little bit about your well, sure. daily yeah. life and the way technology helps? Um, first, I had a spinal cord injury in the New York City subway in 2018. 
Uh, and, you know, before that, you know, I was windsurfing uh, uh, into my late 50s, doing bump and jump on, on the ocean. So I was quite physically fit uh, before. And in a half second, my whole life changed. In the first weeks, I was completely paralyzed from the neck down. And in the hospital room, uh, my son uh, helped to set up our, our own Wi-Fi network. Uh, in, in the hospital. The, the hardest thing was getting the hospital technician to tell us about the TV and how we could put a Chromecast on the HDMI input on the TV and change the channel. There right. was no, there was no re, you know, normally you have a remote where you can change the source um, to go from, you know, whatever cable connection they have to the HDMI input. And it took about 20 days of asking for the tech support person every day until they they finally um, re responded with that. But then um, I was able to, uh, with the switches to turn lights on and off and the air, it was summer in New York City and the air conditioning wasn't always working well. And I was able to get a fan in the room and be able to turn the fan on and off with that and in the middle of the night when they would come to give me meds, instead of the aide turning on the overhead bright lights, which was a terrible shock, uh, I could have a smaller uh, light that I could turn on and off with voice commands. And my fingers didn't work. And I mean, now I can press one button and a few things, but at, at first I, I couldn't use the remote to call the nurse and I, I was able to use uh, my Google smart speaker to call the, the front, uh, the nurse's station. Uh, the, the first time I called, they hung up on me. They thought it was a prank call and didn't believe that a, a patient might actually be calling them uh, in, in, in such a manner. But it made things infinitely easier for me, but I couldn't be on their Wi-Fi network. I had to establish my own. And um, there was... Uh, at first, we tried an AT&T hotspot, but then that was $10 a gigabyte. Right. Uh, there are definitely challenges in getting these set up. I mean, Ron, uh, thank you for, for, for talking to these points. And we'll, we'll have to do an interview with you and have some more discussions about the way technology relates to the adaptive uh, needs of, of individuals. But, but I appreciate you raising this. And thank you for raising this point here about... Um, uh, uh, the, the refurbishment of, of uh, devices. Um, any, any last quick thoughts you have, Ron, before we sort of move on and open up the discussion to uh, uh, some other environmental issues? Uh, well, I'll just add that, you know, digital in inclusion. You, uh, yes. My last name is, is Suarez. I was born in Spanish Harlem, uh, grew up working class, uh, but then got a PhD here at the uh, University of Michigan. So I used to be a psychology professor way back when, but yeah, cognitive psychology, artificial intelligence, those kinds of things. So just cool. a little more. <laughs> and I would encourage people, Broadband Institute, it's a cooperative platform. So like Uber, connecting drivers and passengers, but unlike Uber, uh, nonprofit uh, and run cooperatively. Is that broadband.institute, Ron? Yes, dot .institute is the top level domain. Okay. Well, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you again for well, raising thank you. being with us. Well, um, I want to kind of come back to this issue of infrastructure and we, we welcome others who would like to um, go ahead and uh, raise their hand and be uh, part of our discussion here. Uh, uh, Cheryl DeBerry, I, I, I think she's, she's had to go, but she raised a great question in the chat window here in very rural areas dig once might seem silly to the decision makers. If our roads and crews are 20 miles from the nearest fiber, it is hard to convince them to add conduit and do the mapping to keep track of these short runs. It takes a lot of faith that the investment is worth it and that eventually all those short runs will be connected and viable for providers. It's been an uphill battle to get commitments from our rural leaders, um, you know, again, uh, the connection to the environment is 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 present in the sense that we're talking about a technology that's green. But but let's just uh, see what we can do to address uh, Cheryl's question. Ben, talk a little bit about some of the 
uh, interaction you've had on this issue of, of dig once, of fiber lines, and some of the challenges that uh, both providers and users of uh, higher capacity broadband are facing in rural areas. Well, yeah, let me just raise a point. You know, uh, I had the opportunity to speak with uh, Gary Bolton. Uh, I believe that was last week. Yes, um, yes, no, and, and we'll put the link in the chat here for an excellent Ask Me Anything that Ben did with uh, Fiber Broadband Association CEO, Gary Bolton. Go ahead, uh, Ben, tell a little bit about that. Yeah, and when I had the opportunity to speak with him, one of his points was that, uh, was that we can't, when we're talking about getting uh, service to everybody, and obviously Gary is a huge proponent of, of fiber as the you know, president and CEO of the Fiber Broadband Association, um, we can't say that this is, oh, this is good enough for someone just because they live in a rural area. Um, you know, we, we didn't do that with uh, telephone lines or electricity, and we shouldn't do that now with, uh, you know, just say, oh, because you're a farmer, because you live out in the middle of nowhere, um, you know, you, you're undeserving of getting uh, broadband. So he kind of rejected the notion that uh, just because someone's rural, uh, they don't need as much bandwidth. In fact, if we look at some some of the most serious conversations that are that people are having about uh, about broadband and the need for more bandwidth, is are being had by farmers who live in very rural areas because it enables things like precision agriculture, which is obviously a huge. If we look at the news right now, we look at California. There were just more mandates that came out. That are, t that are about drawing down on the amount of water that is used because they're in the midst of a drought that is only intensifying as it stands now. And so a huge concern for them is, well, how do we, how do we use water? Precision, ag precision agriculture is one of the answers. It's one of the tools in their toolkit. And that is enabled by superior broadband infrastructure. So this notion that, uh, you know, it, I'm not denying that it might be difficult to persuade a, um, a municipality to deploy uh, fiber to low density areas. You know, that's, that's always, that's an ongoing battle, right? But it's a conversation. It's, it's a battle that we can't, you know, that should not be neglected and needs to be fought because a lot of these rural people, these rural communities need, uh, you know, need broadband just as, no, just as much, if not more in the case of precision agriculture. The thing I would build on that is, is the point that I think we're seeing and we're moving beyond the, the world where uh, networks or we think of networks as one technology or another, either fiber or wireless. Practically every network is a hybrid network. There's right. Every wireless network has certainly got a hybrid component. Many, if not most, fiber networks also have some well, they, they do because of the Wi-Fi in the home, right? You've got a wireless component to the last leg of that network. I mean, I've got a fiber connection in my home, but right now I'm on Wi-Fi. So the last 30 feet is, is wireless. Right. But, but, you know, two weeks ago in this program on Broadway Breakfast Live Online, we had three wireless internet service providers and a consultant who works with wireless internet service providers talking about whether WISPs should overbuild themselves with fiber, right? And, and in that discussion, uh, I think precision agriculture also came up. And, and so I guess I would just point out that, you know, at some point you need to have wireless to get to the tractor, right? right? You know, the, the, the tractor is not going to have right. a fiber, you know, string and carrying right, it right. in the I've, field. There's got to be wireless in that. At yeah. Some point too. I, I, you know, I'm a bit of a fiber bug. Like, I, you know, I love the idea about fiber, but obviously, uh, these technology, while some of these technologies might be in part enabled by fiber, it's somewhere, you know, in the system, uh, wireless obviously has a role to play. Um, yeah. you, like you said, you're not going to be having, you're not going to be having fiber run to the tractor, or run to the drone or, you know, right. whatever device it may be. And that's why it's also just important that whenever we're talking about, uh, you know, the next generation of, of, uh, infrastructure, wireless is obviously going to be a part of that. 5G is obviously going to be a part of that. Um, and, and fiber will be as well, but we, yeah. we've got a great question here from Jeff below. I hope I've got that right, Jeff. This is a very interesting topic here in California. There was a conversation about being able to give a green environmental score to broadband deployment. That is not usually one thing that is considered. It is generally, we want more faster for less, especially for broadband to a school, for example, how could you give a green slash 
environmental impact score. I'll let you take that one first, Ben. I'll have, have a couple thoughts too. Sure. I mean, it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting prospect, especially because uh, you know we do put, for example, we put nutrition. We will be at the federal level. There will be uh, nutrition labels for uh, different ISPs that will tell you exactly. Uh, well, I guess in theory, we'll tell you exactly what you're getting and you'll have your price point and, we'll, and you'll be able to kind of compare just as you would in the grocery store with, uh, you know, if, if you're comparing nutritional value of different uh, foodstuffs that you're purchasing. I think it would be really interesting to see, uh, you know, a environmental impact on that as well. Um, in California, that sounds like an interesting initiative. I would be curious to hear how many people it would sway if they would actually make a decision based on because i think for better or for worse a lot of consumers really do view it the way that uh that jeff pointed out which is how much can i get and how can i get that as affordably as possible and uh but i would be interested to see exactly you know how many people would be interested in the environmental impact of their broadband providers Yeah, Uh, Jeff builds on this by saying it is easier to give a green environmental score to say banking. For example, people generally drive to their bank X times a year, an average of X miles. So saving those miles equals X green score. I mean, I think we're we're seeing a lot more of this, the score mentality, right? I mean, like for example, I mean, we've talked, we're talking about green score right now. Ben, you've raised a great parallel thought in the the speed, the the nutrition label, right? So that's kind of, you know, a physical, environmental, so to speak, biological thing coming to environment. But but now with the prevalence of of rating tools for real estate and things like this with, you know, uh, you know, you have, you have lead standards, right. For Mm -hmm. buildings, right. That's a green standard for the impact of buildings, but you also have another measurement for the broadband capability of a building, right. So like Mm -hmm. how, how suited is, is this uh, uh, building to a a, a broadband deployment, just like you also have things like walkability Mm -hmm. standards. So I think, you know, it's this kind of metrics, world that's coming in. And, and I think it's, it's quite, uh, uh, quite plausible, right? I, and I mean, there's so many elements to deconstruct here. So, you know, this is not necessarily our wheelhouse, but I think, I think these are, these are possible and good things to do. Go ahead, Ben. Right. And I would just add that it's difficult to quantify exactly how, how many, you know, we talk about people drive to their bank, you know, whatever we can, we can quantify how, how much gas they use or whatever, but I think it's difficult. It's, Difficult to say exactly how much it saves when you have a household of people who are not, for example, uh, parents who maybe aren't driving to, during the pandemic, for example, a parent might not be driving to work, two parents might, might not be driving to work, kids aren't going to school, uh, and they're all just you know using uh, technology from the home. Ideally, uh, they're just joining via Zoom or you know, telecommuting through Slack or Google Meets, you know, what have you. Um, And it's difficult to say exactly how much, you know, how much value, like put a precise number on that. But we can see like there are fewer cars on the road that is enabled by, uh, you know, distance learning. But but I think it's, it's, like you said, it's a little bit hard to deconstruct these things because they are so uh, you know, it's all kind of entangled and it's, 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 it's a little bit tricky to do. Well, um, uh, Doreen Cornwall points out that uh, she recently saw an item about how many tons of carbon were put into the atmosphere because of teleconferencing, or I guess I should, you might want to say how many tons were avoided, right? But, but maybe, maybe you mean, you know, put in place too. I think that, you know, we, we got to be able to add up the impact of data centers, right? That is an environmental right. cost, right? I mean, one of the things we haven't even talked about yet, Ben, is kind of the cryptocurrency right. environment discussion, right? And, and that's, that's something when we had uh, our Broadband Breakfast Live online, uh, or I should say Broadband Breakfast Live for a broadband breakfast for lunch discussion in February, almost two months ago, it was on cryptocurrency. And, 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 and there we had a kind of a little sidebar in that discussion about, about the impact of, of uh, the, the, the energy consumed in Bitcoin mining. Well, speak just a bit about that for a moment, Ben, because you've been covering cryptocurrency. Sure. So for those of you, for people in the audience who maybe aren't aware of you know, how it works exactly, uh, crypto coins are mined uh, 
when a basically all these computers that are plugged plugged into it are racing to solve uh, an equation. And to get enough computing to be competitive to to mine a Bitcoin or mine any kind of coin for that matter, uh, the amount of power it takes to be competitive in your computing is significant, uh, especially the more people that are on a specific, uh, you know, they're mining for a specific coin. That's why Bitcoin, it's so challenging because there's so many millions of miners out there. And this is a serious conversation that's being had in some countries, uh, such as Kosovo, uh, which has been experiencing uh, blackouts uh, in recent months, have actually banned the practice of uh, crypto mining because it is so power intensive. So, so I guess the point we're getting towards is that there's, there's measurement, right? And, and mm-hmm. measuring and, and getting people conscious of this. I mean, on the, on the broadest possible level, uh, you know, I, I think that there's an increasing concern in the world and in the United States about um, climate change, right? And, and, and this is one of the key, if not the key drivers of discussions about you know, technology and the environment, the environment generally, right? And, um, you know, after the, the, uh, the very significant uh, from a, uh, well, time will tell how historically significant the Russian invasion of Ukraine uh, is, but at least in the present, it seems very significant in what it has done, not only to a, a country by an unprovoked invasion, but uh, in terms of the way the West has united in its response to that. It, and, 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 and I think that the energy discussion has really been amplified because of that, right? Mm-hmm. And so at first, maybe the discussion of green technologies was like, oh, well, we, we, need, we need energy right now. It's kind of like in the foremost. But I think in the longer term, as, as, we, as the war there is dragging on, I think that the, pre- the importance of alternatives to fossil fuels is just really becoming more and more significant. So, uh, you know, again, we we don't we don't pretend to cover you know clean energy in and out the way we we cover the infrastructure for broadband and broadband's impact. But it is it is clearly a a, a more and more important uh, linkage and nexus. And as we have smart cities, as we have smarter networks, we're going to have distribution systems that are smarter, electric distribution systems that are smarter, and whether or not we'll need kind of the capacity to load and upload uh, kilowatts the way we load and upload megabits and 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 gigabits of data is is a question that that we will we will see right. Uh, let's we get some more questions here, so let's uh, keep going through some of these. Uh, Doreen. Uh, asked, Cornwall asks, in Washington, transportation broadband deployment are at least to some degree discussed along with land use with environmental impacts. That's that's a great point. And I wanted to also catch catch sweep in a, a question that Bruce Wolf, another regular uh, watcher, thank you, Bruce, uh, uh, has, has raised. He said, having dig once here in urban San Francisco is the biggest issue is standards for conduit and interconnects from different contractors. Um, uh, Bruce, if, if you'd like to discuss, we'd, we'd welcome you to you know, c- come on and, and uh, uh, join if, if, if you'd like. Uh, uh, just let us, let us know and we'll uh, turn, your, turn your video on and, and we'll uh, uh, hear, hear your question. Thank you. Wonderful, Bruce. Hi, how are you? Great. Yeah, we, we had uh, dig once for quite some time here and very hard, a lot of opposition to actually uh, getting it implemented. Uh, part of that came from uh, some of the problems that we're dealing with here on in corruption. But uh, it, what I what I was mentioned is the biggest problem. They uh, created a, a a restriction that dig once would be optional if it was less than two hundred feet of any. Uh, ground that was uh, excavated. So if it was a long, it was longer than 200 feet. So that would be maybe two, you know, two city blocks. Uh, then uh, they could, you know, uh, do uh, dig once. Once they did that, it would be a different contractor. You know, it's a big, you know, it's 49 square miles. It's a small city, but it's all city. And uh, so what happens is you end up with people using different 
you know, types of conduit, different types of uh, uh, interconnects, you know, or terminals, like wherever they, they stop. You get another contractor comes in, they decide they want to use, you know, some other material. And now how do you connect that everything together? And that became uh, a big sticky point. And it just, you know, gummed up the whole uh, process. Where does that process, in, in brief, where does that process stand for this kind of o open access conduit system that I know had, had been discussed for, for several years? Are you asking me? Yes. Oh, uh, it, it's, it's dead. Yeah. And there's, there's no plan to revive it. There's no, no. Uh, there are plans to revive it, but it's political. Yeah. I mean, we're in, we're in San Francisco. We're, we're dealing with, uh, the whole, uh, uh, you should see how our redistricting maps have changed. Right. <laughs> right? right. Going through that. It is, uh, the gerrymandering It's. I mean, this is just typical, you know, really, uh, knuckle dragging politics. Well, th 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 thank you, thank you for giving us that update, and thank you for raising your your uh, your concern here about uh, uh, the 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 conduit and the the, the dig once. Uh, was there any last uh, comments you'd like to, to make here for us, Bruce? Yeah, I, I would just like to say that um, you know we could have we have started the process of trying to get. Uh, citywide fiber going probably about almost 20 years ago. And when you look at the waste of time uh, that politicians have made, now I, I, I'm very political, I'm very involved here. And there's some good, good politicians that do good things, but I don't know, for some reason, everybody gets scared to go up against the incumbents. But if you look at the cost of what it could have cost back then, 20 years ago to what the cost would be now, even though they can make it cost effective and keep the uh, rates low, fairly low for uh, the residents, it, it really was just unbelievably, even, even adding all the dark fiber and dark conduit that got abandoned here during both dot-com uh, boom and busts, it, the, it just, it's, uh, it's unheard of. And the cost yeah. that the incumbents charge us now is just economical. So I'll just stop there. Well, thank you. Thank you for being with us and for joining our discussion here today. We have just a few more minutes. Um, ben, thanks for being on here with me to talk through this. If, if any one of our, our uh, participants uh, would, would like to um, raise any uh, quick point, uh, you know, please, please uh, message me. Uh, uh, quickly, um, and and we can uh, hopefully still get you in. Uh, as I said at the top of the hour, uh, we we are going to um, have a very uh, full series of programs over the next four weeks. Um, next week, uh, the the sixth, we'll be talking about uh, broadband mapping with a little bit of a focus on in home uh, technologies and measurement. Um, two weeks from today, we're going to have Alan Davidson, the NTI administrator, uh, with us in person at Clyde's of Gallery Place, but also online as we are here. Uh, three weeks from today, we will be talking about um, censorship by a country or, or maybe both censorship by tech companies. And um, four weeks from today, new wires on old poles. So we be coming back to some of these pole attachment, duct placement issues that uh, clearly uh, generate a lot of passion from you, our, um, our viewers and members, um, Ben. Let's uh, let's give you a chance to kind of weigh in on on particularly like where the environmental issue is going, right? Like, what what do you think tech, big tech, right? Let's focus for a second on some of these big tech players. Where where do you see them taking things and messaging this issue? And 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 what's the the kind of the the next stage? April, of course, is the month with Earth Day uh, will be coming up in a few weeks time. Uh, what are some of your thoughts on this subject? And then I'll give some concluding thoughts of my own. Sure, so I think it's, I think we're trending. Uh, I think it's easy to say that it, it's, that it's trending in a direction that people are becoming more environmentally conscious, con conscious uh, and thus uh, companies, including those in big tech are, 
trying to cater to a consumer interest in people. People actually are looking for companies that will meet their needs, but also do so in perhaps a more environmentally sustainable manner. Uh, so I think it's, I, I, I don't want to, you know, joke, joke about this really, but it is kind of in vogue, so to speak, to be environmentally conscious. It's, it's just a good business practice, it seems. But one thing that I, I think is moving the needle more than big tech in a lot of ways, and you touched on this earlier, and I don't want to claim to be a, you know, an expert on geopolitics or anything, but one of the things that I do think is making this less of a partisan issue as it kind of historically has been about climate change and sustainable practices and renewable energy, unfortunately, in some ways, is uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And I think that we will see that there will be a shift in, um, it, you know, uh, environmental uh, awareness and sustainability has generally been an issue that has been championed by the left, not always, but that has been the historical case. And I think that we will see a shift um, from people who identify as being right leaning or right of center, who this will shift from being just, you know, just an environmental issue to also being a, a, a uh, international security issue, whereas we right. cannot be dependent on Russian gas and Europe can't be dependent on Russian gas. And I think that more, that that's really going to shift the needle on it. Like I said, I'm not an expert on geopolitics, but that's just my perception. I think that's really going to make changes in the upcoming months and years. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ben. My, my, I have three quick points to close out this discussion. The first is that um, we've had a lot of discussion during this hour on measurement, right? And measurement of, of uh, carbon footprints, measurement of, of uh, nutrition labels, uh, broadband labels, of walkability scores, of environmental scores. This, this is really key. And I think that, that um, you know, in, in order to um, get at the impacts, the negative impacts and the positive impacts, you need measurement, right? That's part of the game. And, and I think importantly, you know, we're going to see as we get movement towards things like carbon tax, right? The, the great thing about uh, property rights is that when you have uh, well-defined rights, they can be traded, right? And you can get to a Pareto optimal out output. You can get to a, um, a, 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 a situation where bargaining takes place in order to lower the cost. And so measurement is really under underpinning a good economic analysis that with property rights can get you to a good, a good place. The second point is that environment and supply chain are kind of coming together in this geopolitical framework, right? And I think that we're seeing a lot of emphasis on, you know, not relying on some countries uh, networks like Witness China and the equipment, telecommunications equipment that's being ripped out of American networks through the rip and replace funding, but but also now obviously with with Russia and the kinds of uh, you know sanctions that have been imposed upon Russia, they, these are driving us to think in a world of oh, we need to have our own supplies of everything. And I guess I would just kind of caution that that in our global world, while we want to measure and have be good stewards of the environment, we also want to ensure that we have, you know, a good trade system. And certainly some things are going to need to be, you know, uh, produced in America or Western companies. But I, I think that autarky uh, of, of economics is, is not a good solution uh, for us to be trending towards either. And I think the last point, which is really dead on and in our core area of expertise, which is that broadband is essential to smart cities, okay? And smart cities are gonna under, undergird uh, the, the clean environments, the better use of resources, the alleviating traffic and alleviating pollution uh, and, um, and, and reducing the waste of water, of, of, uh, of electricity, gas, other fuels. So, um, so anyway, these are, these are a taste of some of the issues. We, we certainly hope to be continuing to explore these. And as I said at the top, we hope you'll join us next week for another edition of Broadband Breakfast Live Online. Uh, we have our guest, uh, Ben Kahn, and each of you who've been with us and joined us here. Uh, I'm Drew Clark with Broadband Breakfast. We'll see you next Wednesday at 12 noon. Eastern time. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.